name is Kelly and I'm with the Muncie Public Library. Today we're going to be reading the first chapter of Monstrumologist by Rick Yancey. Monstrumology. The study of life forms generally malevolent to humans and not recognized by science's actual organisms, specifically those considered products of myth and folklore. Or the act of hunting such creatures. The director of facilities was a small man with ruddy cheeks and dark, deep-set eyes, his prominent forehead framed by an explosion of cottony white hair, thinning as it marched towards the black back of his head, cowlicks rising from the mess like waves moving towards the slightly pink island of his bald spot. His handshake was quick and strong, though not too quick, not too strong. He was accustomed to gripping arthritic fingers. Thank you for coming, he said. He released my hand, wrapped his thick fingers around my elbow, and guided me down the deserted hallway to his office. Where is everyone? Breakfast, he said. The office was at the far end of the common area, a cluttered, claustrophobic room dominated by a mahogany desk with a broken front leg that someone had attempted to level by placing a book beneath it and the dingy white carpet. The desktop was hidden beneath listing towers of paper, manila file folders, periodicals, and books with titles such as Estate Planning 101 and Saying Goodbye to the Ones You Love. On the credenza behind the leather chair sat a framed photograph of an elderly woman scowling at the camera as if to say, don't you dare take my picture. I assumed it was his wife. He settled into his chair and asked, So, how's the book coming? It already came, I answered, last month. I pulled a copy from my briefcase and handed it to him. He grunted, flipped through some pages and lips pursed, thick brows gathering over his dark eyes. Well, glad to do my part, he said. He held the book towards me and I told him it was his to keep. The book remained between us for a moment as he glanced around the desk, looking for the most stable pile upon which to balance it. Finally, it disappeared in the drawer. I had met the director the year before while researching the second book of the Alfred Crop series. At the climax of the story, the hero finds himself at the Devil's Mill Hopper, a hundred 500 foot deep sinkhole located at the northwest side of town. I had been interested in the local legends and tall tales regarding the site, and the director had been kind enough to introduce me to several residents who'd grown up in the area and who knew the stories of this mythical gateway to hell, now at the state park. Presumably because the devil had departed making way for field trippers and, hi and hikers. Thank you, he said. I'll be sure to pass it around. I waited for him to go on. I was there on his invitation. He shifted uneasily in his chair. You said on the phone you had something to show me. I gently prodded. Oh, yes. He seemed relieved and now spoke rapidly. When we found it among his effects, you were the first person I thought of. It struck me as something right up your alley. Found what on whose effects? Will Henry, William James Henry. He passed away last Thursday, our oldest resident. I don't believe you met him. I shook my head. No, how old was he? Well, we aren't really sure. He was indignant. No identification, no living relatives. He claimed to have been born in 1876. I stared at him. That would make him 130 years old. Ridiculous, I know, the director said. We're guessing he was somewhere in his 90s. And the thing you found made you think of me? He opened the desk drawer and pulled out a bundle of 13 thick notebooks tied to in a brown twine. 
Their plain leather covers faded to, to the color of cream. He never spoke, the director said, nervously plucking at the twine, except to tell us his name and the year he was born. He seemed quite proud of both. My name is William James Henry, and I was born in the year of our Lord, 1876, and he would announce to anyone who would care to listen, and anyone who didn't, for that matter. But as to everything else, there was where he was from, to whom he belonged, how he'd come to Culver, where he discovered silence. Advanced dementia, the doctors told me. Certainly I had no reason to doubt it until we found these wrapped in a towel beneath his bed. I took the bundle from his hand. A diary? I asked. He shrugged. Go on. Open that top one and read the first page. I did. The handwriting was extremely neat, though small. The script of someone who had a formal schooling when instruction had inc included lessons in penmanship. I read the first page. Then the next, then the following five. I flipped to a random page, read it twice. While I read, I could hear the director breathing, a heavy huffing sound like a horse after a brisk ride. Well, he asked, I see why you thought of me. I must have them back, of course, when you're finished. Of course. I'm required by law to keep them in the unlikely event a relative show up for his things. We've placed an ad in the paper and made all the necessary inquiries, but this sort of thing happens all too often, I'm afraid. A person dies and there's no one in the world to claim them. Sad. I opened another volume to a random page. I haven't read them all, I simply don't have the time, but I'm extremely curious to hear what's in them. There may be clues to his past, who he was, where he came from, that sort of thing. Might help in locating a relative. Though, from what little I've read, I'm guessing this isn't a diary, but a work of fiction. I agreed. It would almost have to be fiction, based off the pages I've read. Almost? he asked. He seemed bemused. Well, I suppose nearly anything is possible, though... Some things are much more possible than others. I took the notebooks home, placed them on top of my writing desk where they stayed for nearly six months unread. I was pressed on a deadline for another book and didn't feel compelled to dive into what I assumed would be incoherent ramblings of a demented non-Adrian. I call that Following, a call that following winter from the director goaded me into unwrapping the frayed twine and rereading the first of the extraordinary few pages. But the little progress beside the little progress beside that, the handwriting was so small, the pages so numerous, and written on front and back, and I just skimmed through the first volume, noting that the journal seemed to have been composed over a span of months, if not years. The color of ink changed, for example from black to blue and then back again, as if a pen had run dry or been lost. It was not until after the new year that I read the first three volumes in their entirety, in one sitting, from first page to last, the transcript of each follows, edited only for spelling and correction of some archa archa archaic use of grammar. And then it goes on into the first notebook, which is this first book. This is actually a series. And if you liked that, then you can come check it out at the library or put it on hold and come pick it up.